Welcome to Redirect Immigration Law and Perspectives, a weekly dive into the world of immigration law and its human consequences. This week, we're joined by Matthew Archambault, co-host, fellow immigration attorney out of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and the dissident peasant, Jeff from Georgia. We're going to talk about Jeff Sessions and his legacy and all of that good stuff. It's a good conversation. I mean, Jeff Sessions lost his Senate primary a couple weeks ago. On the one hand, that's great. And on the other hand, uh, it seems like the legacy of Jeff Sessions lives on. So we've got to wrestle with that a little bit. But hey, folks, if you like this show, you should uh, subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify. You can leave a review, say something nice. You can become a patron at patreon.com slash redirect. Give us a little bit of money to help with the hosting fees and all that good stuff. The episode is going up on our feed and on the Dissident Peasant podcast feed. Fingers crossed. Enjoy the show. Of course, this is the Distant Best Podcast slash Redirect Crossover. Wow, I've never done a crossover before. I feel so hip and cool. That's awesome. <laughs> it's like Steven a, has a killer crossover. Is that right, Steven? Yeah, that's a basketball reference. Um, yeah, we like to do that. It's true. This is like DC Marvel. You know, they, they have the crossover comics growing up. Like that, but better. Yeah, it's just... And if I remember right, those are usually like the most interesting comics, but also the ones that are just like the most batshit insane. So I'm not sure which one of those we're going to be today. It's a perfect analogy, in other words. (laughs) But I I grabbed uh, the two co-hosts of Redirect slash they grabbed me, I suppose, whichever one you want to look upon it, Uh, because we all wanted to talk about a guy who's kind of been like he floating under the radar a little bit right because there's a lot going on in the world but his political career is over and so it's time to take a step back and look upon the life of jefferson beauregard sessions (laughs) and maybe develop a little appreciation uh for his way in the world and how he's uh wielded his power uh i know you guys both are like real big fans of him having worked with his officials <laughs> in several <laughs> capacities. Big fan. Right. You know how they say like, if this were a movie, it'd be everything is just too on the nose, everything that's happening right now. And I think Confederate monuments being torn down at the same time that Jefferson Beauregard sessions like his career is torn down. If somebody brought the movie script to me, I'd be like, the metaphor is just, it's a little heavy handed, you know, but. Yeah, it's just a little like blunt to be good fiction. And the guy was literally named for Confederate general. By the way, my name is Jeffrey, not Jefferson. And I was not named for any Confederate soldiers of any kind. (laughs) So I think go for me. Do you think it's weird? I mean, we're told that like the statues have to exist for us to remember history, right? Because otherwise, how would you know history without statues? But you don't name people after things that you consider like horrible chapters in history that need remembering. Like nobody's named Pol Pot, right? Like so that you don't forget. And so this is a person who was born into the world and given this name, not in order to never forget. Nobody names their kid 9-11, right? (laughs) Uh, (laughs) yet but anyway so the the fact that like this guy was given this name a name is something you normally give you know based on somebody that you respect or love or whatever anyways it's just something i've been thinking about well you know i think it was a family name and you know i don't want to go too far i'm a generous spirit these days you know, you are your parents or your grandparents or your great grandparents. You, you can always choose a different way, no matter who you're named for. 
But he didn't do that. <laughs> My son is named John Lewis. And quite frankly, he's a selfish little prick. Right. You know, names don't make a person. He went the other way with it. Yes. Hey, you know, it's type of equality, I guess. <laughs> So I had, you know, a lot of different ways we could tackle this. We could just walk through his life. That would be a little pedestrian, literally, I guess. So instead, let's talk about fascism. Now, I don't know about you guys. I tend to think that we are heading in a fascist direction in this country, or at least something so close akin to fascism that it really makes no difference to call it something else, call it neo-fascism or fascistic or pseudo-fascist. Proto fascists, maybe, you know, splitting hairs. I think we're towards fascism. And there's at least one reason I think that. I think we're already there, but go ahead. <laughs> well, for purposes of my argument, because uh, you guys are lawyers, <laughs> I thought you guys liked argument, right? I crafted this for you. <laughs> there we go. But my argument goes like this I want to stress this to the audience and both of you. These are not the only two characteristics of fascism. They might not even be the most important ones, but they're definitely two of them. The first is highly militarized police state, punitive legal system, like more so, right? And it's usually organized along lines of race and ethnicity, sometimes religion, other things. It also, importantly, is designed to suppress the left, the communists in the 30s in Germany and any left nascent anarchists in America slash socialists. He's also suppressed by police state. And the second is the cult of a leader, loyalty to whom is synonymous with patriotism and approaches absolutism over time. So Trump doesn't need a huge base of fans to do what he's doing. He just needs a base large enough and enthusiastic enough to dominate the political system in question. A base that, for example would stand by him even if he committed murder in broad daylight. Yeah, like, yeah, that's an excellent point. (laughs) Yeah, just an example, not literally pulled from nowhere, of course. But the one thing about cults of personality is that if you're in the leader's favor, you're good. If you're not in the leader's favor, you're not. Trump has his picks that aren't necessarily politically simpatico with him, but that he likes personally, gets along with, doesn't want to cross needs in some way. These people are in and it doesn't matter that they're not really his political allies. He's also got people who are his political allies who see things the way he sees them, who want to make America the way he wants to make it, and yet are not his allies, at least not anymore, now that they've lost their Senate primary in Alabama. (laughs) Yep. I think I know who you're talking about. Yeah, I think everybody knows hopefully who I'm talking about. Matthew, are you following along? There will be a test later. I, um, so far I'm, I'm okay. I'm okay. Can I ask you a question? I'm deviating a little bit and you can cut this out, but somebody yesterday on Twitter posted something about DHS and said something like, luckily these guys are buffoons on like the Gestapo or something like that. Like the idea being that like Hitler and the Gestapo, I guess, were some sort of geniuses and, and really smart and savvy. And it seems like they were probably also just like dumb guys with guns and hate in their heart. <laughs> I, I hate that criticism of the clownishness of fascists. Not because fascists are not clownish, but they are always clownish and hilarious and funny and buffoonish until they are very suddenly not those things. Like, I mean, actually, Stephen, when you think about it, like how many... Police officers, do you know? None that I know. I've only heard this from other people. That are just not the smartest people in the world. I mean, they're literally like, you can't believe that they were able to make it to work. But they're the same people that are kicking in doors and ripping fathers away from children and all that. So you don't need a high level of intelligence to be a fascist. It's really kind of open up to anybody, you know? So maybe that's the appeal. I think about it on both ends. One end is like a proud boy, maybe, or something like, you know, some loser, some weirdo, you know, and then he's funny and he acts weird. He's got posters with memes on him. Everyone makes fun of him. And he's a clown to laugh at until he grabs a gun and he shoots a bunch of people. Or you can be like, I don't know, Mussolini or whatever the fuck, right? Or Hitler. You know, I, I hate to just like drag those two, you know, trump cards out of the hat. But before they were really in power, 
They were covered in the press as clowns, buffoons, idiots, morons, because they were. <laughs> like, they weren't smart. The German police state, the Italian police state, these fascist states, they were not ruthlessly efficient machines from the very beginning. They grew that way over time once all opposition to them just vanished. If you want to look at these two things, a highly militarized police state, punitive legal system, and the cult of a leader, Jefferson Beauregard Sessions this is a good character to use. And we're not going to walk through his whole life now, but I think starting around 1986, one year after I was born, how auspicious. Um, <laughs> but by that time, like he already had a rep, uh, a pretty extreme rep, actually, among a lot of people. The thing he was probably most famous for is he was the U.S. attorney for Alabama at the time. He botched an alleged voter fraud case in Alabama against three African Americans. And I, I say botched in the sense that, like, the case was bullshit and the jury's deliberation took only three hours to return. Yeah, it seems like it. I mean, I mean, it seems like the jury thought so. <laughs> um, that, among other things, oh, many, many, many other things we don't have time to get into, right? He complained about the ACLU and NAACP as communist front groups and un-American, allegedly called a black attorney that worked in his office, boy, other stuff. For this reason, he... When he was nominated to be a federal judge in 1986, he did not become federal judge in 1986. He was basically too racist to be a federal judge. And that's sad for him. But I know, Stephen, you wanted me to get a hold of that letter oh, yeah. from Coretta Scott King, right? Yeah, I'm looking at it right now, too. I mean, do you have it? I do. The whole thing is about 10 pages. But I think maybe just the first page and maybe a little bit more, I guess, if you want. It's probably fine. We don't have to read it, but I, I'm just looking at the, there's a two paragraph version, a letter to Strom Thurmond. Is that the one you're looking at? Yeah, that's the first page that I have and there. Oh, there's okay. more. And it's a statement of Chris Scott King and the nomination of et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, it's just, imagine having that letter written <laughs> about you. It seems like that would cause like some serious reflection and introspection, but I don't think that was the effect here. Her letter begins, it's not too long, I'll just read this part. Dear Senator Thurman, I write to express my sincere opposition to the confirmation of Jefferson B. Sessions as a federal district court judge for the Southern District of Alabama. My professional and personal roots in Alabama are deep and lasting. Anyone who has to use the power of his office as United States Attorney to intimidate and chill the free exercise of the ballot by citizens should not be elevated to our courts. Mr. Sessions has used the awesome powers of his office in a shabby attempt to intimidate and frighten elderly black voters. For this reprehensible conduct, he should not be rewarded with a federal judgeship. I regret that a long standing commitment prevents me from appearing in person to testify against the Sabini. However, I've attached a copy of my statement, closing Mr. Sessions' confirmation, requesting my statement, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then the statement follows, which is a bit long for us to really get into here. But the point is, is that like 1986, I don't know, you guys are a little bit older than me. I'm not trying to call you out, but I'm 35. <laughs> so I wasn't really aware of like politics in 1986, but um, it wasn't, <laughs> wasn't exactly a woke country, right? Yeah, well, yeah, the thing that stands out to me is I think that even today people have like kind of a cartoony version of what racism is in their mind. Like you got to put on your hood and then you go pound a, a cross into somebody's yard and you light it on fire. Not that that's cartoony, but just a very extreme version of racism. And what this letter shows is that racism a lot of times puts on a robe or dresses itself in the law to uh, keep black people from voting, which is, by the way, something <laughs> that is very much still on the news. You know, just like the Confederate statues, you know, we're seeing voter suppression really being in my opinion right now, like other than maybe the pandemic, one of the most important issues of the day. So, I mean, the more things change, the more they seem to stay the same. I mean, for my part, I'm much more interested in <laughs> the real material effects of denying black people to vote or diluting their voting power in unjust ways, shutting them out of the political process, basically, in this country. than I am with monuments. The monuments will get taken care of once 
there is a sufficiently democratically distributed amount of power in this country because like those people aren't that popular if you think black people are people because black people don't like big glorious statues of confederate generals either but the reason they don't have the power to get them not put up or taken down is because our political system effectively excludes them from the table the other group or related group, I guess, other than just African-Americans in this country, that Sessions worked very hard to keep in their place, as he might put it, I suppose, are immigrants. And I bring this up because like, after he loses his federal judge slot, that's when he goes to the Senate after a short stop as the state attorney general, right? And I think this part's important because like, once you're a senator, you can be a conservative on any number of issues, right? You know, you ask Jeff Sessions about, I don't know, uh, trade agreements or whatever, like he's going to have a big business-friendly position, right? You ask him about, you know, corporations and their ability to formulate arbitration agreements that are binding on all their customers, void class action. Yes, 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 yes. Environmental protections, you know, he hates all that stuff. It's fine. Once you're a senator, like you can decide, you can prioritize your office. You have a staff. You can pick bills that you want to champion. You can write your own bills. Introduce them, right? And when he gets into the Senate, immigration is basically all he really cares about. It's what he runs on every cycle in Alabama. It's what he devotes the most amount of attention in his office to getting done. Stephen Miller doesn't join his staff until 2009. But even before that, there's no non-blunt way to say it. He wants America to be a white man's country. That's it. Yeah, but I mean, blah, 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 culture, blah, 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 whatever. (laughs) (laughs) How do they dress that up? I mean, it's usually like our culture is under attack or they're not assimilating or these sorts of things. If you go back and you you look in that time frame, when you're looking at what was going on in California and all that, you at some aspect, you understand why people in California they have had issues, right? Because it's there, the immigration, I don't agree that they should have had issues, but it's really kind of like in their face, you know, in Alabama, that always kind of struck me as sometimes you have the most presently like opposed to immigration in places where, I don't know, it just doesn't really seem like it's as top of mind well, as you would say, like in Los Angeles or San Diego or New York or up in in North Jersey, where you have, you know, a lot of immigrants like so, Jeff, you're from that region. Yeah. Down there. So maybe I'm speaking out of turn. But when I think of Alabama that I speak of, I think of Iowa with Michelle <laughs> Stephen King. You know, I, I just it really on a day to day level, really much of an issue other than what Stephen was kind of alluding to, you know, white supremacy. It isn't like California, I'd say it's not nearly so diverse as that. But this is a still rich farmland down here and we still grow things. And I'm sure both of you know that like the agricultural industry relies in large part upon immigrant and migrant labor to this day still to operate. Aren't those people kind of by design more hidden from like the everyday folk in New Jersey? We have a lot of farm workers, especially in South Jersey, but they're essentially hidden. I'm not saying anything good about Jack. Anything it. wrong. <laughs> it's quite the opposite. It's like it doesn't really seem to be an issue that would really be top of mind for people in Alabama. I'm just saying it just seemed to be on top of his mind for I think reasons well, talked like, about. Like I've always said, like remember when Trump said that I think Long Island was literally under control of MS-13 or something like that. Like you could imagine a scenario where something like that happened in reality, in which case it would, you know, having MS-13 be at the top of your issue set would kind of make sense. If they were literally taking over by force and violence, you know, American towns, like I would be concerned about that, but it's not real. I think that's kind of what you're driving at. Like, you know, the said that it was, you know, such an important thing for the people of Alabama because of something, yeah, it doesn't, I was just going to make the point that like in the South, especially over the previous, I'd say 20, 25, 30 years, 
even the more white, conservative, homogenous, sparsely populated parts have been suburbanizing. And as they become suburbanizing, they have been mostly white in most places, but not always, especially closer to bigger urban cities, of which Alabama still has a couple. And you couple like this with the agriculture industry and the also huge amount of military installations scattered throughout the South, which obviously the United States military is a huge body and is pretty reflective in terms of demographics of the population writ large, at least more diverse than Alabama, say. And all this kind of combines to, there are real changes happening in their communities in terms of like the colors and sorts of faces that they see show up. Now, it's not a problem for most people. Jeff Sessions works and people like him work to inflame it and make it more so, right? (laughs) But it's just to say that like, even like white rural parts of the South, like you'd be surprised at how much contact there is with people who are not like them. And sometimes that fosters resentment. Other times it doesn't. Jeff Sessions is working at the one. Right, and when you're racist, it doesn't take a lot. I mean, we had Luis Cortez. He's an attorney. He's from Mexico. And he's told us stories on the show about having the cops called on him just for walking in an area that's more affluent. And so, you know, a lot of white people, not most, but a lot of white people, especially ones who might harbor racist feelings, it's not like they need 10 families to move into the neighborhood again. It could literally just be one person walking by and the next thing, you know, they're on the phone with their senator, you know. Or some black guy jogging through the neighborhood, right? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So, And you are right that a lot of those workers here, Matthew, are pretty well, like, segregated by design, I think. You know, they live in certain trailer parks in certain places. So, like, in this, yeah, they are hidden. So, in that sense, they're not a real big issue. I mean, it is a conversation I have with some of my friends from high school. I grew up in upstate New York who would be a little bit anti-immigrant and will follow Trump's lead. And my question would be, how has immigration affected you? And a lot of them really has it, you know. And so um, to kind of pop up this point, it is just more of a scare tactic and it's classic white supremacy in it really shouldn't have been the issue that really propelled Jeff Sessions to start him in Alabama. It should have been something more about helping agriculture, helping the economy there. But he leaned on white supremacy and he found, you know, some people that really liked yeah. that. <laughs> and he also found a presidential candidate eventually who really liked that, which is something, you know, this is really like maybe kind of obvious to remind people of, but I do think it's important. And it was like four years ago now. Trump's campaign from the beginning, the first speech that he gave was primarily about keeping America white. He wanted to keep out immigrants. He said so deliberately, plainly, with a huge spectacle and sense of showmanship. And Jeff Sessions is like a really different guy from Trump in a lot of ways. Like he's a Yankee, he's a Southerner. This guy's named for an old Confederate war general. Donald Trump has a, you know, a weird ass day that used to be German, right? Like he's obviously deteriorating physically, mentally. It is a giant piece of shit just to like interpersonally form a relationship with. And yet Jeff Sessions was on his team from the very beginning, from August of 2015, actually. And the reason he was is because they agreed fundamentally on this really important thing. They don't want non-white people to feel at home here. They don't want them to feel welcome here. They don't want the government to be for them. They don't want the society to be for them. And that really was not free trade, not defense, not Putin, not the European Union. None of that bullshit (laughs) mattered to Trump. He wanted to run on keeping immigrants out. Right. And in 2020, it feels pretty normal, like that a Republican senator would back Trump because that's become the norm. But at the time, I mean, Trump was still pretty weird, definitely expected to lose. And he endorsed him during the primary, right? Still. I mentioned August 2015. That's the time he put the hat on. And he didn't actually like come out right. and say, here's my man. I endorsed him for president. I think that came like early the next year. But he was still like the first 
and only senator to the whole primary to do it. And he did endorse him before he started racking up wins and like body Jeb Bush, which we all loved. Like I was right. I did. Right. So in other words, there were plenty of like regular, respectable Republicans who were plenty anti-immigrant themselves in the race, but he just couldn't resist the distilled hatred. <laughs> Well, that and like Donald, Donald Trump's always about being bigger and better than the other guy, right? Like, so like, yeah, they're all racist, of course, and they're all anti-immigrant. But like, if you're going to try to play chicken with Trump on that, like you're going to lose. <laughs> Sorry, Matthew, go ahead. The thing with Jeff Sessions, though, he does not come out of the playbook of someone that Trump would really like or admire. I mean, just looking at him physically, he's short, right? He's kind of... He looks so, like a keyboard yeah, elf. Just say he looks like a keyboard elf. <laughs> exactly. And he's not like out of central casting. Look, I am very sure that Trump would much rather have Mitt Romney have Jeff Sessions' worldview and be like Jeff Sessions in his support because Romney is, you know, he's big and he's good looking. And, and I think Trump would really like, like that. And I think he's really hurt that Mitt Romney's, you know, against him at some point and some level. But Jeff Sessions is this small, weak, meek little figure that's a virtual uh, white supremacist. I guess that white supremacy, at trait, was enough for Trump and also his undying support and adulation. But when Jeff Sessions recused himself, Trump saw that quality that kind of manifests in his appearance of weakness. And he saw that as weakness and then he couldn't have that because he didn't have his undying devotion, even though one thing that Jeff Sessions has done in his entire career that is somewhat honorable following the law and his ethics and recusing himself from the Russian investigation is just way too far for Donald Trump. All right, well, since you brought it up, like we have to talk about this because I thought about this a lot. I don't want to talk too much about Russia and any scandals involving it either now or during the campaign. I just don't want to get into all that. But on like a meta level, we all remember the coverage during the election and then thereafter about Trump and the Russians. And there was a bunch of smoke. We all remember this. So many news stories about different things. Okay. And I do tend to think that from a like a media criticism standpoint, I'm not a fan of all that stuff. And as a political project, I think it was a mistake to lead so hard on that. But people who say it's all fake, it was all made up on the left. And I'm not talking about the fake news right, okay? My question to them is always, and I've never gotten an answer to this, if it was all fake, why did they care so much? And by they, I mean Jeff Sessions and Donald Trump. Because they were getting along swimmingly in all ways until Jeff Sessions, for some reason, decided to recuse himself for many matters involving Russia. I don't quite understand who on the left was saying it was fake. What? Oh, you're going to make me like name names, I guess. Well, you know, well, I, I, no, I'm just I'm just trying to. I, I uh, suppose I was thinking Russian collusion was fake or that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Or, or, like, yeah. Like oh, there was nothing there. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking about like Matt Taibbi a little bit. I'm thinking of I guess, Aaron Mate, maybe following this crowd to a, a few others. Like and I'm not trying to pick any fights or start anything with any of them. But I think their arguments went too far because it created a real rift between these guys to the point where, like, we'll get to it at the end. But Trump just got done stabbing him in the back, metaphorically speaking, in a Senate primary. The criticism on the left, I don't know too many that go so far as to say nothing happened, but there's a lot of what about is I'm like, well, we do it too. Or that the media specifically like Rachel Maddow or MSNBC were too distracted by it. They gave it disproportionate coverage to what ended up being there, according to, you know, certain people. Well, which I agree, I agree with, but that's different from saying like, it's not worth covering at all. <laughs> right. You know, and, and I do think there's a lot more there. William Barr was very disingenuous. And that's another way of saying that he was lying about what was actually in the report. So that, I mean, William Barr is a whole nother it's a shit that we can talk about at length we'll one day. We'll save a little bit for him at the end. Just a little side. I mean, Jeff Sessions was correct. I mean, the only thing he could do was to recuse himself. Well, Stephen, Stephen I, I don't told think, me I don't think why he was, did it. 
Or at least he gave me a theory because I couldn't figure it out. Because you're right. Like, it is the right thing to do to recuse himself. So why did Jeff Sessions do the right thing? Because it doesn't seem like his style. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Well, I, he is institutionalist. I think more so than William Barr, that he believes in these institute. Now, he believes institutions in, in ways that we don't like. But he was too involved in everything not to recuse himself. And he actually said it, I think, even before he was nominated that he would recuse himself. So, you know, Trump kind of goes back and tries to make it like this was a sh- surprise that he was going to recuse himself. It really was. It was the only probably correct thing that he's done in his entire career. So, but and, I, and I don't think it was courageous at all to recuse no, himself. No, exactly. It, I think he was feeling nervous about his own position. <laughs> well, I, I think it's like waiting for the walk signal at the crosswalk before you cross the street. It's just what you're expected to do. And if you do it, you shouldn't be lauded or anything. It's just like, oh, okay, yeah, you followed the rules of society. Congrats. So yeah, this one time. <laughs> I, mean, I don't. So you know. the bottom line is this Trump wanted a fixer. Now, whether or not like you oh, know, yeah. he's and he said like basically that, you know, we have him on the record on that. So if he needed a fixer, I'm just asking like what needed fixing? Like, was there nothing to fix, which is sometimes the position of some people who I think believe quite rightly that, like, Russia is a bit of a distraction from other very important problems that we're facing as a society and politics. But that's like kind of another issue. And I don't want to conflate media criticism with, like, the actual merits of the thing. And my number one piece of evidence for there being something very important and fishy that happened there is that. Trump fucking blew his shit <laughs> over this and started publicly berating his attorney general for like months. And it was kind of funny, right? Like that. Well, years, right? I mean, it's still going on. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't uh, stop. I don't stop. Yeah. Anyway, it's indisputable that they're not allies anymore. And not just on the level where Trump's like saying dirty stuff about him on Twitter, <laughs> calling him like weak or stupid. Because after Jeff Sessions was out at Attorney General, he wanted to go back to the Senate. So he went to Alabama. He entered a crowded Senate primary, one that just took place about a week or so ago. And he lost to a Trump-backed candidate named Tommy Tuberville, who I don't give a shit about right now, except that he beat Jeff Sessions, right? Right. And, you know, they, they might be basically simpatico politically, you know, they're not really any difference. But like the reason Jeff Sessions is out is because the cult of the leader, <laughs> like he can't be right no matter how much they agree. Trump says he's an asshole. So he's out. I don't know anything about this. Whatever his name is. What's the What's the guy that beat him? <laughs> Tommy Tuberville. Tommy Tuberville. He was a head coach of the Auburn football team. That's OK. Right. Right. Well, so like. There's no way that that guy could be a more effective racist than Jeff Sessions, right? So it does show that, you know, the white supremacy brought them together, but the loyalty, the personal loyalty is the Trump card, no pun intended. But don't you, I catch myself saying that all the time now. And I used to play spades a lot too as a teenager. Did you guys play spades? Uh, yeah. No. Didn't. It's like hearts, except your goal is to get books and not lose them. That's it. <laughs> Anyway, you use Trump cards all the time. It became a phraseology of mine way before Trump became president. Well, I mean, the thing with Jeff Sessions, right, he is like the classic bootlicker. And if he was reelected to the Senate, even all that bullshit that Trump talked about him, degraded him and all that, he would be right back there licking his boots. I think what it was, I'm glad that Jeff Sessions lost because I think he's a piece of shit. I think Tommy Tubblefield is probably equally a big piece of shit, but he's not going to have the power that Sessions would have in the Senate. And quite frankly, he's going up against Doug Jones, which everyone expects Tommy Tuberville to win that election. However, you know, Jeff Sessions would win that election because Jeff Sessions is an experienced politician. He's not going to do anything really dumb. We know everything about Jeff Sessions. Tommy Tuberville, I feel like, you know, whom maybe this guy might really step in it or something comes out because he hasn't been vetted. So but it is. Uh, it's it's going to be interesting <laughs> to watch. I mean, it's better. Yeah, he's oh, just in, as very he's, slightly. He, he's not going to be as an effective white supremacist if if elected. And I mean, Trump could have just kind of said, "Oh, let's put this behind me with uh, Jeff Sessions. He's the best person to 
forward my agenda. He's going to have more power in the Senate because, believe it or not, he is kind of respected in the Senate. And he just couldn't see past that petty little reference, you know, that he has with Jeff Sessions. Yeah, I mean, everything though, turned out OK. Hey, I was going to say, even though he managed to, to come out virtually unscathed, right, from the whole the whole episode, it, it still didn't matter. But I'm curious, is there more on the outline or can we talk a little bit about like maybe DACA or? Well, we skipped over a bit of that, but I wanted to talk about specifically his actions, at least some of them as attorney general and specifically as related to immigration and customs enforcement and other stuff like that. Yes. Yeah. So this is an audio podcast, but people can look up the video of Sessions coming out to announce the rescission of DACA in September of 2017. And DACA is a very, very, very limited benefit. I mean, I know there's a lot of beneficiaries, but it's not this great path to citizenship or a reward for the parents who brought the kids here or anything like that. If anything, DACA has actually served to punish the parents in some ways and other immigration contexts. We don't have to get into that, but it hasn't been great for the parents that brought the kids here. So it's basically a work permit and a social security number. That's it. And yet, the smile on Jeff Sessions' face when he came out to rescind DACA and really throw the lives of these people into what's now a three-year tailspin of uncertainty. I remember we got a Nintendo for Christmas. This was like five years after the Super Nintendo came out because we were poor. Oh, but boy. Yeah, I know. It was horrible. But just the most excited I'd ever been about anything. And it's that's the look on <laughs> Jeff Sessions' face. It's literally like a kid at Christmas. I think that's oh, it's, it's really it's disturbing, actually, if you see it. And you understand what's going on behind well, it. And just like as a senator, where like you're going to have to vote and have a position and opinion about any number of political issues, right? As attorney general, it's kind of the same, a little more limited, right? You're basically, the, the law enforcement and, and the legal system and stuff. But still, lots of different kinds of people, cases are going to need your attention. And this is the stuff that he was like, not just professionally animated about, i.e. like his office churned out a lot of shit and memos, but this viscerally, his energy, his face, look at him. This is literally what he lives for, is to make these people... Miserable. I can't imagine like being the kinds of person who would like such an act would bring a huge bill grin to my face, right? Like it's just disgusting to think about. Right. Well, the one thing that we have, Owen, and when I say we, I'm talking about people who care about immigrants and on the immigrants' right side, is that they're actually really bad at what they're doing. As we see with the recent Supreme Court decision with DACA, but even if you go through his seminal decisions and matter of Castro Tum and matter of AB, matter of LEA, all these things are being knocked down by federal courts. Now, a lot of pain is going on in the meantime before they can all get knocked down. They're getting knocked down. And, you know, it's just they have from a legal standpoint, from a legal writing perspective. If you go read matter of Castro Tum, matter of AB, the late if there's a new decision out from J. William Barr, who's ever in the background writing these things, the worst legal writers I've ever seen. I mean, it's not, I mean, I mean Stephen has sent me some of his briefs, so I, I don't I want to be careful. On par. I say that. <laughs> on par. <laughs> but, you know, when you when you're grounded in white supremacy and that's like your backbone, I don't think it leads, fortunately, to really sound legal reasoning and product. So hopefully we look back 20, 30 years from now and we just see this as a blip, like something really weird happened and these people got in charge and they tried to do all these things and it got knocked down and kind of a blip as to on the whole systemic racist part of our whole entire system. Like the difference between this and like the systemic racism that's involved is, is that they want it to be. They're all of a sudden like jumping out like a fucking pimple getting popped. Like, here we are. And that's really you gross. Know, hopefully you can knock that down. That and, is, and yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know. Well, I, mean, I mean, I mean, racism and white supremacy is disgusting. So let's keep that. I, I like that example. 
<laughs> well, I think the reason why, you know, when they talk about Trump nominating all these judges, I mean, there's going to be some delay, but you see a lot of these decisions getting struck down at the circuit courts by Bush appointees, Reagan appointees who are looking at this stuff going like, what? Like, what are you talking well, about? I mean, in the third circuit, you're seeing them getting struck down by Trump appointees too. <laughs> so, well. I mean, Judge Bebas here in the third circuit has been pretty strident against a lot of these new things that Trump is doing. So we also have some district court judges here in, in the district that are Trump appointees that are towing the line. But Jeff, I don't want Jeff, I don't want you to think that we're hopeful at all. <laughs> we, we are not. This is us clinging to something, you know, desperately. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that, I our only hope is that they're not the brightest and they're incompetent. But the reality is what Stephen's saying is that they're putting a lot of the same like-minded people in positions that are going to be there for a lifetime tenure. So when I was looking at all, you know, some of the stuff that Sessions has done at DOJ as the attorney general, especially in regards to immigration, you know, I found a lot. Whole episodes can be done on just, you know, each one of them, you know, do a whole series. It could take hours to describe exactly why these speeches are bullshit and why Jeff Sessions is terrible and why this is all contributing to the racist project that is fucking America. But we don't have time for all that. <laughs> but one thing that really did stick out to me more so than that stuff really is this jiggering of the rules about cases themselves and how judges can manage them, decide them, use them, how much time they have, whether they can administratively close them and under what circumstances. At every point, for as I can tell, no real reason except that he can because he's the boss and they all technically work for him. All these courts, like even though they're courts, I believe, like statutorily, they're all associated with the DOJ. So they're not independent in that way. Like the judiciary is pretty large. Am I right about that or am I wrong? I don't know. I know you're right. I mean, you're actually kind of referencing the decision in matter of Castro Tom which has been overturned, I think, now in the fourth circuit and another, another circuit. So and that's probably going to fall here in the third circuit as well. But essentially, that's a decision saying, kind of dictating to immigration judges how they can run their docket. So it's a guy from the top on his employees, basically. This is how you run your courtroom. And, and we all know that we believe judges should be independent. Now, every court system has their own rules and procedures and all that. And so it's not uncommon, but he really kind of stepped over a line here. And, and I think you see a lot of immigration judges, not a lot, not enough, have kind of pushed back. But what we're seeing now is we're seeing a lot of new immigration judges. And maybe one day me and Stephen can do a, a separate show on Matt O'Brien, who is a head of policy at FAIR, the... Um, Federal American, or I, I forget what, they're just a white supremacist, anti-immigrant hate group. Yeah, foundation. Fair. Matt O'Brien was the head policy guy. He's now going to be an immigration judge in Virginia, in Arlington, Virginia. Immigration judge. It makes you long for the good old days of 1986 when Jeff Sessions was too racist to get a federal judgeship confirmed. <laughs> I mean, that is like akin to, some, I mean, for our people who might be listening that are on the right side of the spectrum of someone who's like in some type of open borders, you know, society becoming an immigration judge or which I would be totally cool with. I'm available. Um, but it is really shocking when you see the judges that are being put on there and a lot of military, a lot of people from JAG and from the military. And, and I think that's a reason that those people know how to follow orders. So, yes, <laughs> we'll see. But it's going to be even if Trump loses and Biden becomes president. And let's say even if Biden tries to unwrap a lot of these things that have been done. And I think that's a question that we all kind of have, you know, how much is he really going to try to undo? You know, a lot of the damage is going to be there. It's going to be systemic and it's going to be worrisome as we go forward. You know, we're probably going a little bit long, but I wanted to give a, a real life example because, you know, when we talk about like judges managing their dockets, that might be abstract for a lot of people. 
I had a client come to me. She'd been put into removal proceedings by an unscrupulous attorney in California. There's these attorneys that go up and down the coast doing presentations at churches and stuff and promising green cards to people and putting them into removal proceedings with the hopes of presenting certain removal defenses. Well, this lady has a severely disabled child who is now over 21. So she doesn't qualify for the defense she was supposedly going to get, but she's got this son who's, you know, very, very disabled and depends on her and no criminal record. She's, you know, whatever. She's the glowing perfect immigrant. Not that you need to be. So she ends up in court and in the good old days under, you know, the last three years or or so of the Obama administration, the judge would have had the power to put the case on the shelf basically and say like, I'm not going to spend any resources trying to deport this lady, given the totality of the circumstances. We'll let her stay maybe at a future date. If something changes or whatever, if she gets arrested, we can reopen the case, but we're just going to put it on the shelf. And what Sessions was saying is judges shouldn't be allowed to do that. They shouldn't be allowed to remove the lady who's lived here for 30 years with a severely disabled son from their docket so that they can focus on other less sympathetic cases. They have to fall down just as hard on that lady as they would on anyone else. And basically turning judges into little deportation machines. And that's what he wanted. And and even though, like Matthew said, some of this stuff is getting reversed, as we can see, it's taken three or four years. And who are the people, who are the bodies that lay in the the wake of all of that? And even beyond that, if you have someone who's in immigration court and they're waiting for, say, a process that's with USCIS, because sometimes these things don't run in parallel tracks. It used to be that the judge could administratively close the case and kind of put it off to the side. So oh, you wouldn't have to deal with that. And now they can't do that. Or the judge could just terminate the case. So you could go and then it's off the docket completely and it frees up resources for maybe, maybe going after the so-called, I'm using air quotes, bad people. So uh, it just or from, maybe just another worthy applicant who has good uh, legal reasons to stay. Whatever the next case is, the point of all these changes that Sessions made to me is really not just to get worse decisions, at least from our point of view, I'd say, right? but also to get them slower, right? To make the caseload larger for all these judges to back things up more, to make the system work less well for the end user, which is, you know, people who are trying to stay in this country. And for no other reason, because a lot of these changes, these administrative changes, there's no good reason to do them and they don't have to provide one and they don't. They well, just I, do I do it. think at some point they're trying to break the system. They, okay, you know, this system doesn't work anymore. So therefore let's do it this way. And this way is obviously not going to be a better way. And I, I just also think like the, yeah, the brokenness is also like part of the point, both in terms of like, it gives you like shitty decisions and also like it takes a really long time to even get those. Yeah, that's <laughs> and right. Jeff Sessions was all over this. I just got my second phone call from my wife. Oh, my wife. My wife. Oh, shit. Well, hi, which Happy. means the first phone call I can ignore, the second one I can ignore, the third phone call would have to be... uh that's okay. I, the I appreciate both your time today. I suppose we can wrap up with the closing thoughts that you have. If there are any before we go, I guess, Matthew, since you're such a hurry to get out of here, you're so important. Why don't you go first? Go. <laughs> Jeff Sessions sucked. I'm glad that he's politically dead. Well, let's see if he's really politically dead, right? You know, if Trump loses... Who knows, maybe he can reinvent himself without Trump being there. So we can kick the dirt on him. Let's say if it stays on him. Well, my flaming hot take is that Sessions isn't dead. He lives on through his protege. It's some sort of force ghost spirit transfer. I don't know if I'm getting my Star Wars uh, (laughs) doctrine correct. Uh, I haven't really followed the development of force ghosts, but Sessions lives on through Stephen Miller, who outlived Omarosa, John Kelly, all the rest. And is not just sort of like dinking around at the White House, but he seems to be pretty much in charge when it comes to immigration. And so 
on the one hand, while we feel good about the toppling of this particular Confederate relic, in reality, his work lives on. So our work should too, I guess. Well, here's my final thought where I hope that the presidency of Joe Biden is like the directorship of Ryan Johnson in the second Star Wars movie where the Force and the Jedi and Jeff Sessions' legacy, none of it matters. And nothing is true and uh, everything is fake. And uh, I'm going to toss the lightsaber over my shoulder. And just like I'm going to toss every single one of Jeff Sessions' political ideas and actions as Attorney General. That's my hope. Oh, I, lo- <laughs> I really love being where this analogy is going. Let the Trump administration be Luke Skywalker's lightsaber from Empire Strikes Back in episode... What is it? Oh, shoot. I lost track. Five. I have, I have no idea what you guys were talking about, to be honest. I was more of a Battlefield Earth guy. I got it. I am, I am <laughs> personally anti-Star Wars. Ugh, okay, we don't need to talk about that. <laughs> Matthew. Matthew's Steve. bad takes are just, you know, on full display today, especially here at the end. But that's okay. That's I right. still really appreciate both your time. Thank you, you guys. Thanks, Jeff. All right, thank you. Thank you.